paranormal Karen. She's so spooky, paranormal Karen. Funny too, paranormal Karen. She's so spooky. Oh, we didn't mention she's funny too. Yeah, cha cha cha. Hey, everybody, welcome to the podcast. So excited. I don't know if any of you guys have noticed. Season one was great. Season two is phenomenal off the hook, including my guest today. Uh, but before we jump right in, I just want to tell you it's March 13th. You can see me tomorrow in Camden, New York at Nicole's. Also, get ready for, uh, oh, I'm going to Montana in April. In May, you can see me at Wisecrackers in the Poconos at the Mohegos, Mohegan Sun with Sonia King, the animal animal communicator. We're doing our stand-up show. It's going to be great. Uh, and then in July, I will see you in Waco, Texas. I'll get you more details. But let's get to today's show. Uh, are you ready for this, everybody? We are talking about the positive side of the Ouija board with Karen Dahlman. She is director of the Talking Board Historical Society, a paranormal researcher, an author, and uh, the book you want to take a look at, Go Grab and Buy, is called The Spirits of Ouija, Four Decades of Communication. Uh, Karen there's no more Karens left. Have you noticed that our name is like filtering out? We're just a meme. <laughs> we we have become a meme. Every time they do this funny joke about uh, Karen and the cat, it's this white cat and a woman named Karen. I'm thinking, well, I have a white cat and my name is Karen. That's so strange. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm paranoid because there's that other meme that says Karen wants to talk to your manager. And I am so, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I do that, right? Like when the post office isn't done, I'm like, I need to speak to a supervisor. And I do too. You go right to the top. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like no one else does it, but now we have this jinx on us. Like we're not supposed to do that. And, uh, and all also, Google it. We're a, we're a haircut. Google the Karen haircut. It's the big sweep over to one side. Neither of us have that. Oh no, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, so Karen, uh, so much to talk about because I am also one of those people. I understand. Well, let's start with you. How did you get involved in the paranormal? Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I at a very young age, I was always seeing things and I was told that I just had a really active imagination or as as plain pretend. Um, but I, I had an imaginary playmate who wasn't imaginary at all. I was told he was imaginary, but he would come and talk to me and we would, we would have conversations. We'd play together. And I was often asked, you know, who are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> are you talking to yourself again? <laughs> For my mom. And um, I remember she just said, you know, you can't just when you go to school. So I, I got started and I didn't know it was paranormal. I didn't know it was supernatural. I didn't know it was unusual. I saw auras. I heard things, saw things, uh, all kinds of stuff as a child, but I kind of tried to put it away going to right. school. I thought, yeah, if I, if I'm going to go to school, I'm told that if I'm going to be a big kid. I, I can't be talking about such, such things. So I, I just really wanted to fit in and try to be what was considered, you know, quote unquote normal. But, but, that's where it started for me. And it wasn't until I got older that I looked back and I realized, wow, there were some magical things happening there. Yeah, I had an imaginary friend and I do not remember seeing him, but I know that his name was Ben. And when I sort of uh, became, when I was getting readings and someone told me, well, that was probably a guide or something, I sort of that was where I started. I figured I had another guide named Ben, which probably had a better name than that. But at the time, you know what I mean? Like it kind of gave me something to relate to. So, yes. So do you do, um, it sounds like you kind of, which I think goes with everything. You're a little bit in tuned with everything. You got the psychic thing going on, the medium thing going on, the definitely the, the, uh, you know, the, the knowing going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, I've got the, the clear sense that some of them, some of them working better than others, and and all of them working at some point in my life. You know, whether it's hearing or seeing or sensing it, um, or being intuitive, empathic, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. So, and, and by the way, my my uh, friend, my little playmate, his name is Daki, and I really thought he went away. But I got to tell you, when I wrote my third book, he came back out, and I thought. 
where, where's he been? He said, I've always been kind of in the wings, just waiting for the right time. But he wrote this brilliant poem that is in my book that just explained our relationship as a child. It really, really came full circle, which is interesting. They, they, they are still around if you tr- choose to call upon them, but they're there for a purpose as a child uh, and, and more whimsical and as a child would understand than then maybe they are for an adult. But I, I find it fascinating that a lot of people I know, and, and you're one too, Karen, who started this way with their little friends. You know, okay, so, uh, and what is the name of that book? Because I just feel like a uh, hundred of my listeners are going to be like, wait, I that's a very interesting and wonderful thing I've never heard, which would be to go back and have a discussion with your imaginary friend about your childhood. That sounds incredibly healing. Well, it's crazy. I mean, the book opens with him talking. He's like in the very beginning of the book and, and then he comes back at the end. Um, and that was not an intention. It wasn't, it wasn't like I tried to do that. It just happened. But that book is called The Spirit of Alchemy, Secret Teachings of the Sacred Reunion. And that book is really more about working on or off the board, mostly off the board. We'll, we'll get into talk about the Ouija board in a second. But being able to make these connections with your spirit guides and ultimately with source wisdom, with that divine being, with that all that is. And that book takes you on a journey of doing that. And Daki was the beginning of my journey of being able to recognize us and acknowledge it. Wow. That, uh, you know, uh, so how did you get to the Ouija board, which by the way, um, the, I'm so, I was like a day away from going to the giant Ouija board opening in Salem. Oh, <laughs> I would have loved to have met you there. Um, yeah, that was Ouija Zilla. That was, and, and of course, Calvin, our, our mutual friend was there. He's also a director of the talking board historical society. It was something that, that our, our buddy who's also, he's vice president of the talking board historical society, Rick Shrek, a fabulous artist uh, designed and created, and we all came to help him build it and put it together. But that was a phenomenal event. It is the world's largest Ouija board. Um, and it was just up for that weekend uh, back in October last year, you guys. However, we are going to be traveling around with the planchette, which is 15 feet long. Um, and it's it's a workable planchette. <laughs> and you people can do photo ops with it. But yeah, that was an incredible event in, in Salem, Massachusetts. Oh my God, keep me up on that when that's happening. I don't know if you guys would be okay with this, but it sounds like a great 8 by 10 for my website. <laughs> oh yeah, but we're doing photo ops. People are, people are going to be wanting to take photos. We just asked for a small donation because we, we raise, we're a nonprofit organization. We, we put it towards doing events like this. Uh, and our, the whole thing behind the Talking Board Historical Society is really to sh- share the information about the true history of the board. And we're a group of collectors or aficionados or people that love the board. And, and it's rich history. What's that, what's that about? And, and how is this tool used and who used it? And how has it affected the, 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 psyche of, of Americana? How has it affected the, the world's psyche? Because um, there's such a um, disdain and also a love for it. And right. it's very controversial. We really are just trying to say, hey, uh, it's a real tool. It's a real game that's here and it's not going anywhere. And I don't consider it a game, but it is marketed as a game. Um, yes. So- and, and I saw some of your videos uh, about talking about how you talk to your guides with the Ouija board. Oh, yeah. I, I met, I in fact, I met not Jackie. Jackie was pre Ouija board, but I met a group of beings that I call them the, the guides of source wisdom. And they came through, through the board in 1994. And I've been communicating with them ever since. Um, yeah, you, you can meet, you can meet all types of benevolent, um, beings that are here, but with nothing but love for you. And that includes our deceased loved ones. Now, you know, when the board came out in 1890, it was it, the Ouija board I'm talking about, and it was actually uh, patented and trademarked in 1891. When it came out, it came out during the spiritualist movement. Right. So the spiritualists, yeah, snatched it up, and it became one of their tools. Um, it, but it, but it, it was developed by a group of business people, men and one woman, and they just saw an opportunity uh, to jump in on this craze that was occurring in Ohio. People were taking their cutting boards or tables tops and putting the alphabet on it and numbers and beginning to work with the concept of a talking board. And that was in 1886. So when they saw an opportunity to mass market this and sell it, they jumped on that and they actually have it tra- uh, trademarked and patented under the guise of a, of a novelty item or toy or a and, game. And that's Parker Brothers, right? 
No, that was actually uh, Kennard Novelty Company, which later became the the Ouija uh, Novelty Company, which then later became William Fold Company, which then sold to Parker Brothers in 1966 and then became Hasbro, who owns it now. Okay. And uh, you know what is an interesting thing is uh, I watch a lot of astrologers on uh, YouTube and they keep talking about the planets are aligned right now, almost exactly where they were when the spiritualist movement became so strong. So it's almost like you can really see that, that it's coming up, uh, you know, this is really becoming, the paranormal is really becoming quite a thing now. Uh, in this, And so before the uh, Ouija board, it was actually... Actually, like you were saying, people were using cutting boards or cardboard and making their own boards. Yeah, and and it was just then they just called it a a, a board that talks. So that's where the word talking board comes from. There was no Ouija boards before that. Everybody just says, oh, they came out of ancient China or they came out of Greece. There's no proof of that at all. There were different. There were always, as you know, Karen, apparatus and, and items to use to read fortunes and divination. You know, th- casting um, ruins or throwing the bones or or using stones or. All kinds of different divination devices. Though the Ouija board is something really relatively new in the succession of all these devices, which is 1886, the first time we ever saw it appear. And we know this because there were articles written about it, and they went to the Boston Globe. And back then, if you if something went to the Boston Globe, it went viral, because <laughs> that was <laughs> how things went viral was through the newspapers um, back then. And, and so we do know we have this history. This is what we do. We dig this stuff up and and try to educate people where the true history of this came from. And it's not a super old tool. Again, it's mid 1800s. Well, excuse me, late 1800s, 1886, but it was 1848 when the spiritualist movement started in New York. That's mid 1800s, which is what you're referencing with the astrological movement. And then, and then the, the, the spiritualist movement went all the way into the, you know, 1900s and it's still around today, as you know. And in, in the Fox sisters, was that sort of the, the jump off point of the spiritualist movement? It really was because it was when you, they were beginning now to have ways to communicate with the, with unseen dimensions or they, back then they believed it was the deceased and somebody who was dead and supposedly buried in the basement of their house. Well, the girls heard the, these rapping sounds and they would communicate with it. It'd be intelligent, spelling out the letters of an alphabet and they get words from it. But they later recanted their story and said they were just cracking their knuckles and uh, underneath the table and popping their joints and making these sounds. Yeah. Um, so we don't know what the real truth was, but yeah. um, they could have really been doing it. But then maybe they felt forced to, to recant or maybe they were lying the whole time. Yeah. For people that don't know, the Fox sisters were a couple of sisters that uh, lived in upstate New York. In fact, I should the next time I'm there, I should go take a look. And they just started. Was it rapping on the walls or stuff like that? And they and then their dad sort of turned it into a, a show, uh, which I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's sort of, and then people came from all over to hear. And yeah, that is a, it is interesting. We don't know if they were lying or not because they were actually destitute when they said that, but who would pay somebody to just make sure that they, you know, it's a very strange story. As it, those, those are really trying times back then because, because um, there were a lot of charlatans and a lot of people were trying to just prove that the stuff worked, and and rightfully so, because there was a lot of people that saw an opportunity to make money at these revivals or tents, uh, seances or, whatever, or pop up shop seances, you can call them that. Right. And, and it was it was an exciting time because people were going, we need to speak to our deceased loved ones. We just went through the Civil War, uh, we had great carnage, and then here then along comes World War One. So there there was just so much reason. Um, to lie about it, but all because people were, were destitute to speak to their loved ones. And, you know, so people wanted to disprove them. So they, they were pushed into that. It was their older sister that really got them into the movement. And, and she was the one that pushed them into recanting the story. And then um, it was, it was really a sad thing, but for the while there for several years, they were the top of, of the, of the crop of people doing these spiritualist um, types of seances. You know, I I also kind of have a theory that um, it's almost the way, uh, first of all, everything is so individual, what you believe, what resonates with you, what works for you. And I always find it interesting, no matter what it is, like, uh, I think John Edwards was the first guy that came out, had that show, affected a lot of people, then everyone said, oh, it was a hoax, or right. they jumped on him. Same thing with the lady that did the first kind of paranormal TV show out of England, 
uh, oh, it's great. Oh, it's a hoax. Like it almost feels like there's always going to be such a backlash that you really just have to go with your gut or what you know. Absolutely. And and th- th- that's we come to the Ouija board, which is um, it, it definitely has a major negative backlash. And, and, you know, Karen, I got started back in 1973 using this tool and it was just it brought to me from some friends who said, we've got a new toy, what our game we want you to play. And I thought, OK, let's try it. And it, it immediately worked and they swore they weren't pushing it. And the next thing I know, we're speaking to one of the girls uh, was a twin at birth and her twin died shortly after birth. And I did not know that. I learned the story because of the Ouija board. It started spelling out. And I said, who are we talking to? And they said, this is our, our dead sister. And I was just amazed that we could communicate with this little baby. But the baby was growing up on the other side. It was also a 10-year-old girl like the girl uh, the, the older girl who is the twin. So that amazed me. And because I was you know, learning to use the board in 1973 and also in a vacuum way before social media, way before people telling me, oh, you can't do this. Oh, it's the e- evil. Oh, it's demonic. I was doing it and having wonderful experiences with it um, and beginning to communicate with the other dimensions. And it just progressed from there. Even in the 80s, I started communicating with the angels and other kinds of ethereal beings and and just the, it just went on to different types of beings I communicate with. But I was doing it way before the Internet hype and social media and people saying, oh, it's bad. Or even if people were saying it was bad in the 70s, which they did, um, I wasn't around that group of people. My my family had no problem with it. Santa Claus gave it to me as a Christmas gift. <laughs> <That's the best. laughs> I went to That's church that morning sourcing. after yeah. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I it was just that. normal. Actually, yeah, yeah. It was just it was just a normal thing in my house. And it, 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 it truly it was. And so I think that's why it has always been a very positive experience for me. So I, like you said, you stay true to your own course when it comes to things that people say, oh, the, the naysayers or this doesn't work or you're pushing or you're making it up. I'm like, my God, I'm a mid 50 year old woman. I, like I better things to do than pushing a planchette <laughs> around on a board. You know, I that's what I'm thinking. That. And, and so I'm thinking, you know, that's fine. I, what I, reason why I do what I do and I'm willing to share with people is I want people to understand not so much the Ouija board, but that there are these loving beings out there. We are surrounded by a pantheon, if you will, of different types of beings that love us and support us. And these include your deceased loved ones or transition loved ones and our pets and all these other beings that are the angels that, that really support us and want the best, best for us. And so I show them one way. One way to communicate with these energies, which I know, Karen, you have your own way. Everybody has their own way to do this. Right. And I just happen to show this way. And I want to say, no, this has got a negative rap to it. There doesn't have to be negativity unless you choose. And you could choose it if you want. Right. And, you know, I, I have a joke in my act where I say uh, someone told me a Ouija board will scream if you burn it. But I found out that's only true if you light it on fire while it's still in your friend's lap. Exactly. You're holding it in your hand. Yes, you're going to scream. <laughs> hey, and hold on one second. I have a question about uh, something you just said. Hang on, folks. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. It's me doing an ad for me. That's right. I keep forgetting to say this at the end, so I had to take out an ad on my own podcast. First of all, thanks for listening, and I love all your feedback. If you have a comment or a story or just want to say hi, email me at karenrontowski at gmail.com. Also, go to karenrontowski.com or paranormalkaren.com, and you can get my tarot class. That's right. It took me two years to put it together. It's eight classes, about an hour each. You will be reading tarot by the end. While you're there, sign up for my email list. Everyone should do this. I only send out an email about every two to three months, and it's filled with typos and misspellings, so you know I haven't been kidnapped. And that's the best way to keep up on comedy dates and whatever is new. While you're there, you can book a 30- or 60-minute tarot reading, or you can get a gift certificate for somebody else. I got a little bit of merch left. If you want a Paranormal Karen Shungite sticker for your phone to make it safer, you can email me about that, or I now sell Paranormal Karen reusable straws. You take them with you wherever you go. Maybe you're doing cocaine with someone that doesn't look like they're clean. Boom, you got your own straw. KarenRontowski.com. Okay, so this is a little Ouija board adjacent, but you said um, you got the message from the girl's sister that she was growing up on the other side. Yes. That's just a fascinating concept. Do you have more to add to that, or have you had that sort of thing? Oh, it's okay. happened to me. It's happened to me several times, and, and the, there's always things, there's a critical story you can share about sisters 
um, that if you want to, when we come back on because uh, well, not just on that on one. Now. We're back on now. So yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't know you we were back on. Great. Hey guys. Uh, okay. So it's, it's fascinating because um, that story that started with the little sisters, um, I, I didn't know where that would take me. You know, of course not. I was only um, eight years old at the time and I was just enthralled, not just that, that the Ouija board worked, but that there was this, this little girl that was growing up, but she was also the same age as they were. Um, and so I ran home to tell my parents and they're like, yeah, sure. Wink, wink. But, but then I still got the Ouija board for Christmas that year. And that's when I started. But now fast forward to 1986. So here we are 13 years later. And I had taken the board now at this point to college. And I was in a sorority and I had some, a few of the girls there that were interested in the board as I was. They were really curious about exploring using this tool and what the, who they could reach. Um, and so we were sp- mostly speaking to deceased people. Um, but, uh, you know, I said, you know, we could probably also speak to other beings as well. But we focused mostly in uh, that year in 1986 with deceased people. And I had some girl, other girls in the house that said, I just don't buy this, Karen. You know, I, what, what are you doing here? And I said, well, you know, let, let me show you. Back then, I, I wanted to, in a way, prove my point. Like, right. oh, it works. I got to show you. I got to show you. So I said, well, look, come and come on just down to this room. We'll go into our secret chamber room. We'll lock the doors. And there was like eight of nine of us in that room. And we, we were so confident. My, my friend Linda and myself were so confident. She was, she was my board partner back then that it would work because we were using it all the time, we decided to blindfold ourselves. Oh, interesting. Yes. This story is actually in the book, The Spirits of Ouija, Four Decades of Communication. But there's more to the story I won't share, but they'll share this part of it. So we blindfolded ourselves, sat down at the board, and we put our fingers on a planchette, and all the other girls were just sitting around us. And I had one of our other friends who used the board with me, Dina, and she was going to be the scribe and just write down every letter that the planchette stopped on. Well, sure enough, the planchet starts moving. It moves really fast. It was moving pretty quickly for us, but this was super fast, strong, a different energy than I had felt before, hitting each letter, stopping on it. Now, remember, we were blindfolded, and so Dina's writing out the letters, and I told she didn't say them out loud. Typically, I'll call out the letters when I'm seeing the letters come through. She would just wrote them down. Other people in the room were just watching. Some people, I think, were getting some of the words, and they told me later they understood part of what the message was. And then I hear somebody crying, and I just stopped, and I said, are you okay? Should we continue? She goes, no, no, go ahead. So we fit, We kept going. It got, went, 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 and then it stopped. Abrupt stop. Boom, done. I said, okay, take your blindfold off. Dina, please read the message. And here's the gist of the message. I'm not I'm going to not quote it because I don't have the book in front of me, but the message was this. And, and I'll tell you what, Karen, I've never forgotten the feeling of this message. It said, hello, Lindsay, this is your sister. I'm with you. I'm with you now. Tell mom and dad that we are all with them as well. We miss you. My boyfriend's here as well. We died immediately on impact. There was no pain. In fact, the only pain we feel is the pain that you guys still carry and you expressed at our funeral. Oh. Please let us know. I know. Please let us know. That please, please, we want you to know that we are fine. Tell mom and dad we are fine. We will always be with you. We will see you again. I love you. Wow, did I get the chills on that. I still do. I'm emotional about it still because, number one, there's a girl in the rooms crying, Lindsay, who I knew, but I didn't know that well. I didn't even know she had a dead sister. So here we are with another dead sister story. And this dead sister, transition sister, is in the other dimension, right there, a, a vibration away, communicating through the board. Now, there's only one other girl in that room that knew she had a deceased sister. The rest of us did not know. She cried and sobbed that gut wrenching cry where you like just lifting off this burden she's been carrying forever on her shoulders every single one of us cried karen in the room there was not a dry eye it was just amazing and so finally i said okay enough of the fun and games i know i proved something to you guys today i said but that's not what this is about this is a tool that you can use as an agent of healing from grief I said, I'm going to use it from here on out as as such a tool. 
Uh, you know, that's a very interesting that you made that proclamation. And I think that may have something to do with like your, uh, success with it. Because it's funny because even I have had, I've heard, I haven't had, I've heard terrible Ouija board stories about, uh, strange things, which we can get into that stuff later. But I know I read tarot and some people are freaked out. And it's mm -hmm. like, these are pieces of paper. They are not magical. They are <laughs> right. nothing bad is going to happen. I actually, I kind of tell people, you know, they get so afraid of the devil card. Oh my God. You know what you should be afraid of? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are going to kill us all. Don't worry about tarot cards. It's mosquitoes. It's like <laughs> exactly. But, uh, no, worry about people. Worry about people right. walking around out there in the street. Right, right. So um, also, and I know this in my, in the front of my brain, that it's a, another, it's just another tool like i know people that somebody that had a gin actually get attached to their pendulum so we're just talking about different situations do people run up to you and tell you their negative ouija stories all the time um i get both now i i think i get more positive ones but i do i do get those as well and you know it, it really what it boils down to is how you approach it again i i, I preface this whole conversation by, by saying i i was kind of doing this work in a vacuum before social media internet hype and there was a lot of negative negative books out there on it there really weren't that many um i think the first one came out was by uh stoker hunt and it was the world's most dangerous game. And even in his book, he had some um, positive things in there as well. But there were other books out there, like the book by Gina Kavina, the Ouija book, which is nothing but positive. Um, there's some books earlier in the 1900s that, that referenced the Ouija board, such as the Betty book, The Unobstructive Universe. Those books were positive. I didn't even read those books at the time. I was just exploring this on my own so I could make a proclamation like that because we were having positive experiences. And when anybody ever came to me, even in the 80s, and said, oh, it's negative, I said, you can have that if you want. That's not what my experience has been. And so I just stayed true to that course and realized early on that our mind and our belief system and our hearts, what we hold within, what we harbor within, really affects what we're going to get in the world at large in our lives and not just on the Ouija board. I was already starting to make those connections. Um, and, and again, that was 13 years after using this tool when I started, when I made that pro proclamation and it just kept, you know, strengthening from there because if people said the negative stories, even now that's their experience. I can't discount that, but I have to also ask them, what is their, what is their psychic makeup? What are they harboring within? What, what fears do they hold? What have they been told? And, and not to blame me, but just to say all those things are filters factor into our experiences, regardless if you're using, you know, pieces of paper as, as as, as Karen uses, and I use also use Oracle cards or a piece of cardboard or compressed uh, particle board uh, or wood when I use the Ouija boards. It, it's really not these items itself. It's ourselves and what we how we want to what we want to bring to these items and how we want to use them and what how our filters, how we see the world are going to affect that. That's what I look at. So when people say negative experiences, I don't focus on the board. I focus on their lives. What was yeah. going on in their life at the time? Great point. And also, you know, I know some people and they're always saying to me, I want to see something. I want to see a demon. And I'm always <laughs> like, no, you don't. And you're not in my circle. of, You know, what right. like, don't bring that energy in here. Um, so sometimes you have to be sure who you're doing it with their intention. Absolutely. I, I you know, I, yeah, when I was younger, I sit down with almost anybody. Uh, but they were also kids and they and they were just so innocent and nobody really knew what was going on. And most of my friends didn't have the patience to sit there long enough for the planchette to move. And, <laughs> you know, and so it was like, OK, let's play light as a feather, stiff as a board. Let's do something else. Right. That's kind of right. Spooky. Do you remember that game, Karen? Yes, I do. I don't remember <laughs> playing it then, but I do. Now I do remember it. I think it's very fun. It's all that stuff now. I, uh, that would be a good that would actually be a good episode to do childhood psychic games that we didn't get in trouble for. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody Mary, we did all those things. And so parents would say, all right, if you stay over at Karen's house, don't do the Ouija board. And I thought, well, that's stupid. Why? And I said, well, we'll just do other things instead. We'll just hold a seance with candles. Well, I mean, we're, I'm always going to be talking to spirits. 
I mean, so we don't, you don't need a board, you guys. I want people to understand that it's not the board at all. It's again yourself. It's what you bring, what you draw to yourself. You could sit in a room with all lights on and, you know, bring in negative energy because that's, it's you again. It's not the board. Right. And so now I'm going to throw at you a, uh, this could be a warning or something that I sort of agreed with, which is a lot of people drinking around the Ouija board. That's like a lot of people drinking paranormal investigating. Uh, you're compromising your energy or your aura. So you, are sort of uh attracting you could be attracting negative stuff do you agree with that oh yeah but again it's not the board it's their aura so i yeah absolutely i i say um i say certain types of spirits don't mix those spirits and these and those kind of spirits oh, drinking yeah. spirits. <laughs> so you don't want to mix your spirits guys and you'll have a bad hangover you know if you do mix a bunch of liquor together you know it's the same thing right. so you Think of it this way. Your aura is will look like Swiss cheese when you start imbibing in substances that, that weaken you or, d- or diminish your integrity. So that could be, you know, even caffeine. That could be taking some substances in that, that just make you not coherent within your center. So this, I always say don't drink alcohol when you're using this tool. And, and that would go also with recreational drugs. You open yourself up. And I, I agree with paranormal investigating. Anytime you do this work. So. I um I, I like to do paranormal investigations from time to time. I make sure I'm not drinking. And the people I'm working with, we're not drinking. We're not doing any, anything like of that nature. And same with the board. It's just I want my constitution to be as strong as it can be and as clear because I feel like I have a, a responsibility to my partner, to the energies. And I respect my the spirit guides. And they come through every single session now since 1994. Every time I'm on the Ouija board, they come through. Um, and they come through without the board too now these days. But I respect them so much that I value that connection that I don't want to muddy it up. And I value when I do readings or when I work with people, and especially on the show when I do my YouTube stuff, I, I, I value what I'm bringing through. And I want it to be of the utmost integrity. And I want myself to be that pure channel Uh, you know, when I'm doing this work. So I think that's really important, Karen. You know what, too? This is sort of a spiritual underlying, which is I can already tell your integrity, period, uh, uh, like in everything. And that is that goes back to what you bring to the table, which is if someone is not doesn't have a lot of integrity, it, it may that may be like what you said. What are you bringing into your life anyways? Yeah. So people say, well, they, I, they, I get a lot of questions about this tool, how to use it, all these things. And there are some things to say about using it. But the most important thing we can do for ourselves is learn to be centered within ourselves, to be grounded, to be centered, to know your heart space, to know what it feels like to feel protected within yourself. I, I feel like anytime I do this work and I'm not worried about all that, the negative stuff, I have no reason to be after 40. I'm going to my 47th year of using this tool, Karen. Wow. So using it, it'll be 47 years this summer is when I first Everyone, started. Don't worry about the alarm. That is not about her. <laughs> the board, that's a fire engine. <laughs> well, goodness, that's kind of exciting. A little, you know, background music going on for I've us. I've been using it for 47 years. Oh, um, exactly. <laughs> Ta-da, the angel came so, out the thing. And some of you, if you listen to the podcast a lot, you have heard Calvin Von Crush on, who is the occult collector who has that great museum, also uh, really into the history of stuff. I always say sort of a non-believer because he's a, he's mostly yeah. a non-believer, but I mean, I've read for him and uh, he's called me back for more, re- you know what I mean? That kind of thing. Like he's yes. Have you ever done a Ouija session with him? No, um, he doesn't think it, the, 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 it really works. He doesn't believe the, the he thinks it's a union motor, which is fine. That works. However, the however he he and I, um, well, we worked. Okay, we were in England together last fall, and we worked a paranormal group together uh, using the board. And he was great at it. And one of the, one of the things we told people was that we're like the opposite side of the coin. I, I, I'm the believer who, for me, it definitely works. And for him, no, it doesn't work. And that it, if it does work, it's a senior motor. But what we both agree upon is that it does work. It depends on how you think it's working. Now, I will say this, too. Um, I, I don't disagree with what Calvin Von Crush is saying. Um, how much of this is the idiot motor and how much of it is the spirits? I think it's really a combination of both because I know this. As I started exploring consciousness with this tool, and that started in, in 1989, um, I had just graduated from graduate school. I was a practicing therapist, and I had a few friends of mine who were very intrigued with this tool as well. 
and it wasn't we didn't it didn't matter if it was because of media motor or if it was a higher self doing uh, this uh, and or, you're saying uh, uh, say, uh explain to our folks the media motor that you oh saying. absolutely oh thank you yes um i apologize you guys so media motor basically means that your brain uh, on an unconscious or even subconscious level is controlling the movements it's your fine muscle movements uh for the brain that controls and it's actually yourself pushing it at a subconscious level and so it moves and you're just like oh it's not me um and so it could be a subconscious thing i am not i'm not opposed to that because we did this, this experiment in 1989 where we used, worked worked on the board for 4 years and predominantly we were trying to reach our higher selves which is what we did we made we did make success and when we talked to your higher self uh, we were talking to that part of you that's not just in your corporeal existence in your body but it extends beyond your body and theory it's the part of you that connects you back to all that is and so it's this greater part of you that like the soul or spirit that's not in your body and we would communicate with that now if we're communicating with ourselves, then I guess actually that is a part of myself that's coming back through the planchette to make it move. So I was cool with that. Um, right. So I, I'm, I'm not opposed to the ADM motor. I think it's a combination of your higher self connecting along with your spirit guides. And I try not to get too technical. People ask me to, and I will, and I break it down on how to tap into the higher self. And I talk a lot about that in the, the Spirit of Alchemy book, how to do that. Um, and then I talk more about how to tap into um, the spirits in the Spirit of Ouija, of course. So I, I, I do share both. But I think what's important is that you can let go, step aside, and see that the board is nothing more than your permission slip to access the unseen dimensions period it's just a tool and i and i could like i said i could be blindfolded and it works i, I can look at it or not or look away it's still going to work and i could be away from the, the board and i could still get great messages so really it's myself so so that's the common denominator here that is why it works right i i don't think i'd be a, a nervous to do it with you if, I wouldn't be nervous with you at all either. Right. If you do a, uh, when you do paranormal conventions or that kind of thing, do you have groups that do the board with you? What happens is, is um, typically either we're teaching a course and, and I've, I've taught courses before where I will sit down with each person in the room and help them learn to feel that subtle movement of the planchette when it starts. Cause that's a real tough place to get beyond. Once you can get that to work, you, you're golden. You can start learning how to uh, allow the messages to come. So I will sit down with a lot of people. What I was saying earlier is I'm choosing who I really choose to have be my board partners. I was just going to uh, ask that. Have you regular, ever yes, run into yes. someone and been like, mm, not this guy? Yeah, I have. And I've even had friends that I just, there's something in them blocking it. And, I'm, and we're not getting anywhere, and it's it's very frustrating for me because when I get on the board, even by myself, it works right away. And so it's it's kind of hard to go backwards to uh, kindergarten again with the board <laughs> and starting over where you wait and wait for the movement to come. And it, and it does. You really got to build up energy with each new person. So I, I really look at do I have a, a heart connection with the person? Are we typically friends or do we do we just connect right away? And that's how I base my partnerships on. And I've met people through my travels around the world and also – around the country where I'll meet them at conferences and I just, we have a connection. We sit down and the board works really well. And I've done that time and time again. And those people, if we live close to each other would definitely become a board partner of mine and, and, and vice, and vice versa because we work so well together. So you know who those people are, but yeah, I do sit down with other people. Um, I'll be at Michigan Paracon again this year. And, and I, last year I was there and I sat down with people and I'll sit down with people again and, um, just to help them learn to feel what it feels like, because I got to tell you, the hardest part of this using this tool is that initial feeling of the subtle energies when it starts to move. That's the hardest part. Oh, interesting. And and have you uh, sort of to restructure that question differently? Have you ever had someone that wanted to work with you and you were kind of like your gut went mm -mm, too dark, going to ask for something bad and not say it? If I'm in a teaching space, I know how to I know how to work with that, and I will always teach work with everybody. But yes, in other spaces, if somebody wants just wants to come and use it, no, I, I won't, I won't. And, and I'm I'm real clear. I'm saying, you know, I'm just not feeling this is where we're, we're brought the same level, or or we vibe at the same place, or you're approached the same way I am. And I go, I'm just hold you back because you're just so you, you your agenda and our agenda, my agenda is different. I, I'm real honest about that. If I come across that, and I have, and everybody's like, okay, cool, I get it. I go, but I think your better partner would be somebody that, you know, works on the same level you do 
with the way you approach the universe or the way you approach the world. I think that's important. I look at how people approach the world and are they willing to clean their, clean their own front porch? Are they willing to do their own work? Not worry about cleaning the street out there where everybody else walks, but do your own front porch. Are you willing to do that work? You know, I take it. It's a very psycho spiritual thing for me. I, I take it from a level of, you know, are you willing to look at yourself? Cause when, the guides come through. It's a very personal development kind of session that we have every single time they come through. And it is about evolution and personal growth and the growth of your soul. And so it's a deep level. And so to bring that type of energy through, I've got to make sure they're willing to at least do that and, and look at themselves on that level. Okay, great. I want to ask you about how you do it, a little bit about being a therapist and all this when we come back. All right, folks, we'll be right back. Like medium and buddy of mine, Terry Huberman is with me today. Terry, you've given me so many great readings and healings, and now you've got everything together in one package. Tell me about that. I sure do. So this package has energy healings, readings, and coaching. Coaching, that's the best. And and people, uh, they buy the package. You give them coaching once a week? Yeah, so we meet online once a week, and in between, there's support as well. And, and who would this be for? This is really for folks who are in indecision, needing to get in to their intuition because they're blocked or stuck. They need to move forward. And so we explore what the root causes of the problems are. And helps them get out of their own way. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Terrific. And what can they expect from this? Sure. So moving from anxiousness to confidence, accessing their freedom, joy, and security, and really being in alignment with themselves so they have that clear direction, so they know, aha, this is what I need to do next to reach my goals. So now there's something that's free so people can talk yes. to you and see if this is for them. Yeah, absolutely. On my website, terryhuberman.com, there is a... Uh, a page where you can click and it's the intuitive coaching package and there is a button there that says schedule a free call so you go ahead schedule it we'll get on a call and you can learn more about this program and we'll see if this is a good fit for you or not. see if there's chemistry yeah beautiful <laughs> it's an odd date <laughs> <laughs> terryhuberman.com t-e-r-r-i-e-h-u-b-e-r-m-a-n i highly recommend it folks Okay, we're back. Uh, so Karen, uh, you, I think it really helps, uh, and probably is part of your channel of helping others is that you have a background as a therapist? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I'm a licensed professional counselor in a couple of states. I'm a registered board certified art therapist and I had a private practice for about a decade. Um, and I, I you know, it was a real, it was a, it was definitely influenced, I would say, how I worked the tool. But bef but when I made that proclamation in 1986, I was just an undergraduate. I was a psychology major nonetheless, but I was an undergraduate when I made that that proclamation. And, and that was because um, earlier on, like in my elementary school, I was reading all the books I could on anything paranormal, supernatural, spiritual, anything I could get my hands on that told me there was something else out there beyond ourselves, that there was other types, types of existences and that maybe Maybe coexist with us, but we just can't always see them. And so I had this awareness of something else beyond, and I believed I could connect with it through the tool. And so I had a respect for that because I thought, how cool is this? I'm honored that these beings would want to connect with me. Not everybody can do this. So I saw it as definitely a duty and an honor. And so that allowed me, I think, when I became a therapist to see the sanctity and the and the sacredness of using this tool. And then I, I worked it that way. I worked it as if um, there was a lot of respect for that. And it was a sacred space. It's just not unlike what I would do for my clients when they'd come to see me in a session. I created that sacred space, that Olympic chamber, if you will, where we could uh, be raw and ha and be pr I could be present for them when they're raw and then have that place to do that. And that's how I worked this board every time. It's like we come to the board raw in a sense, open to any messages we may receive. Well, I've said this quite a few times on this podcast, but I believe real healing and therapy is moving into a place where the therapists will be using some sort of metaphysical healing or or think, you know what I mean? Like, I think that just talk therapy is going to be on its way out. I think it's going to move into Absolutely. healing and stuff. Absolutely. In fact, Absolutely. you made me think, because I always tell a lot of my uh, tarot clients that when they're trying to get in touch with their psychic stuff, is to do anything artistic to get that channel open. In fact, I may, um, you just inspired me to look into, maybe I'm going to go to art therapy, whatever that is. 
<laughs> well, listen, that that's what was unique about me. Now, here I was in the, uh, the late 80s, all the 90s as an art psychotherapist. That was my specialty. So I didn't use talk, you guys, although talk would come out when I'd have them role play with the artwork. I had there was a, it was a technique I used that would that allow the artwork to come alive and speak. And it's not unlike what I do when I do oracle card readings, I realized. And and there was definitely an element of the guides with me then. It wasn't like, oh, the guides are going to channel and come through. It was that I felt their presence and some things would come out of me, I would say, that were like, oh, there's a channeling going on here. And I, did, I didn't have to separate that out and say, oh, this is me. This is them channeling. It's just we worked together and I felt that. And so it was beyond the board for, even for me when I was a therapist. But it was. It was using the artistic avenue of allowing people to to – uh, bring out something within themselves and that the art never lies you guys you can talk circles around people with your words but you cannot when it comes to the art you can people think oh i didn't do that it does not about why i don't i didn't diagnose the artwork i didn't say oh black means this i said let's let the black speak what does the black have to say what does the red have to say what does the red say to the black and the next thing you know there's this incredible dialogue and there's memories coming up and they're saying oh my gosh and then this and then you know we would work it more with the art it just we put it back wow. into the art which became a safe place and and giving it a voice and i and i talk about some of my work the first book i wrote, wrote was the is the spirit of elk uh, excuse me the spirit of creativity um, and that book is really about my work with with clients and therapy before I said anything about my channeling abilities or using the, the Ouija board. They the, the spirits helped me write that book based on my work with clients, but it was based on the art, artistic and creative side that I was helping people tap into for healing and health. And so I do share a lot of that in that book. Um, and then, the, and then these ideas come back out again, full circle in this, in the spirit of, of alchemy as well. Wow. Okay. So I have to get that book about the spirit of creativity because there's also, um, I'm actually putting together my, I'm putting together an online tarot class that I'm going to have. Ooh. Goodbye. Well, it's getting very, very long and I'm trying to, um, because tarot is a big topic. You can, you know, you can go on YouTube and see a little bit and get yourself started, but there's a book. In fact, I'm trying to minimize how much of this I use on a beginner's class and it's called the rabbi's tarot and you might find this interesting in that it talks even more about the conscious in the subconscious mind than the symbolism and the prediction yes. And, it's, <laughs> yes and even like the lover's card to me love in that card is she is the uh, he is the conscious mind. He looks to the subconscious mind. She looks up to the angel or the super conscious. And when all these three are working together, that is perfect love. Well, you are now you're talking about alchemy. This, this is, this is what it is. It's the marriage of the, of the, of the red king and the white queen coming together and creating the philosopher's stone, which is that third aspect, which is, which is the trinity, which is what all these cultures talked about. There's a sacredity to this trinity idea, the concept of this, that you can, you can do it male, female, child, progeny. You can do it uh, subconscious, unconscious, superconsciousness. It's all these three things coming together. And that is, I think it sounds like it's a great book. This is what we do. We do this work. We're you, bringing these elements together. It is such a um, fascinating encyclopedia of a book. And, and I find it very interesting because I'm dyslexic. So reading is not my favorite thing, but I always, you know, even now I take in more tarot books. I, I'll just, I'll never turn down a tarot book. And, uh -huh. and I remember that in sort of the first five years when I was learning tarot, this book made zero sense to me. And one day I picked it up again and everything made sense. And I thought, oh, I wasn't ready to hear this. Interesting. And now, yeah. oh, it's just an amazing, amazing book. Um, so, uh, oh, I got so much. I have so many things to talk to you about with so much. Uh, have you ever tried to uh, do the planchette without or even from a distance where no one was really touching it? Um, no, but I've never had that experience either where the planchet just, just moves. And right now, as a matter of fact, I have one of my favorite boards. It's a William Full 1950s board sitting on my dining room table with the planchet on it. People say, oh, don't do that. It doesn't move. I walk by it every day. It hasn't moved in the last few weeks. Um, listen, it, um, it's never happened for me. People tell stories of that. And I, and I don't discount things can happen. I mean, I've seen some weird things myself and had a lot of really cool experiences that are beyond this world. So I, I don't discount it. It's never happened for me. And maybe that's because uh, I don't need that. I, I don't... I, 
people that might need it, that's really cool. I mean, it'd be, I think it'd be cool if it happened and I saw it, but I don't really need that. I already, I'm already a believer. I'm already a believer in the other dimensions. Right. So you would be comfortable with the Ouija board rug, which I just thought. Oh God, I love that rug. If I had room for it, I'd get it. I already have two big, huge carpets that I love, but I, I, I yes, and I, I have a, um, Somebody, somebody made, commissioned me a Ouija board that's made out of glass. It's going to set into a oh. table. So a beautiful Ouija board glass table I can sit at and use. I have, I'm like Calvin. We have so many boards. I, I think he probably has a hundred. I have 50. 50 is a lot, but mine are all over my house. They're in my living room, dining room. They're hanging up. They're like display pieces. They're beautiful pieces of art. And I'm totally comfortable with them everywhere. Wow. And, and for some reason, it seems while I'm interviewing you, I've become a Grand Central Station as for an airplane just went by. I love it. That's a good message. Okay, so um, first of all, I heard, and I don't know if this is true, uh, are the corners uh, symbols that something wants to come through or wants to channel through? Well, you know, it's, it's, it, everybody uses this tool. You come to it with your own, again, your filters, your own beliefs. So things, different things happen. And the way people use this tool can be very different from person to person and their beliefs about it. So people ask me all the time, what do the symbols mean? And of course, my favorite board is a traditional Ouija board that has a sun in the left corner, the moon in the right corner, and it has either down at the bottom are stars or it has this really kind of weird apparition like woman and hands and a head floating around. And that's probably my favorite board. It's the board that I got in 1973, circa 1972, uh, Parker Brothers board. Now, my, when I started using this tool, the different energies would enter through the different corners of the board. And it became really apparent to me, especially uh, in the 80s and then really moving into 1994 when the spirit guides, who I call the guides now I speak with, c- came in. One move came in at the sun. The other one came in at the moon. There was two distinct personalities that came through. So I called them the sun and moon. And in fact, you'll, you'll if you read my books, you'll hear me reference them as the sun and moon just to distinguish one was more masculine, one was more feminine. Although they are androgynous, They've never been born in a physical body. They are light beings, just pure light, and they're a collective group. And there's not just two. There's many. But that's there was that, that was their way to come through and make it simple for me. And I, I'm a studier of the hermetic sciences, the Gnosticism. It goes back into alchemy. And those two symbols are important symbols in alchemy, the sun and the moon. Again, it's the masculine and feminine blending together. And they inhabit the night sky, and they share the space. And there's this such rich symbol to them and I know the creators of the Ouija board um, and originally the, first, the originally it was just two moons and the first board was a full moon in the left corner and a, a, a quarter moon uh, in the uh, quarter moon third moon in the right corner and so that eventually became the sun and moon but I also know too when they were developing and changing the 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 symbolism on the boards, they were really, you know, going with the, the sign of the times. The sign of the times was in the 1900s, people loved the exotic. They loved things from Egypt. They loved things from the Middle East. They loved things from other countries that we didn't travel to back then. You know, we didn't have airplanes in the beginning. We had boats. And um, and so they were really exploring putting these symbols on there. And so I think there's an element of hermeticism in these tools. Now, does it really mean that? Not necessarily, unless that's that's what you believe. So people ask me, what does the sun and moon mean? And it really, what it really means is what it means to you. Because a lot of these symbols aren't going to mean anything to you if you're not, if you don't have that knowledge behind them. So it's like with art therapy. People say, oh, well, I heard an apple means the forbidden fruit. I go, well, maybe to that person, what does it mean to you? Well, apples bring back a sense of you know, wonder when I was a child laying in the apple orchard and picking apples at my grandfather's house and it brought back great memories. I go, that's what it means to you. And an apple to me means well, apple a day keeps the doctor away to me. I said, so we all have different meanings. And so you have to really look at how do you resonate with these images? And and I think a lot of people don't resonate with the images on the ominous looking Ouija board. So they'd like to use spirit boards or other kinds of talking boards that have angels on them and other kinds of imagery you know, for those reasons. Another generation, Apple's going to mean a computer. Computer. Uh, right. I mean, think of that. Right. I, I'm sitting with my Apple computer right here in front of me. <laughs> You're absolutely right. So we have to look at get, get away from uh, ascribing to the meanings in these books or these dream dictionaries. That's fine. Reference them. It's really what do these images mean to you and how do they resonate with you? And that is where you're going to find your true meaning. You know, it's very interesting. I, uh, because I almost speak through tarot, like my friend Dave is always telling me, uh, when I'm in an investigation to either use my cards or I use it in my mind.
mind. Like I'm like, who, uh, you know what I mean? Like I can, yes. I know the cards well. It'd be interesting to make a Ouija board out of a tarot tableau. Ooh, yeah. look at that. And see what happens there. Um, okay. So when you use the card yourself, uh, the board yourself, how do you, uh, well, let's start here and we're going to get to that question after. Uh, do you have a suggestion for people that want to sit down and do this? Should they, perhaps it's a good idea to make a proclamation like you did? Like this is only about a uh, higher purpose or higher energy, or do you have any sort of ritual you do before you sit down? I do. And it's interesting. It became 13 steps. And I put that in the spirits of Ouija. Okay. There's actually 13 steps. And it, that wasn't that was just by chance. Well, well, it was actually synchronicity that it came out that way. And I thought, oh, 13. That, I love that number anyway. That works out. But you don't have to make it so complicated. Um, I like to break it down when people ask me these questions. But basically, I think a proclamation, I call it an intention or a prayer. I always start with that. And I also um, start with first breathing exercise with my partner and ask him or her to breathe and we ground ourselves into the ground and I have a, a breathing exercise that came from the guides. It's called hips to heart. And I walk you through that in my books. And then um, we do that breathing exercise. I state the opening prayer intention. And then uh, we also do a circuitry exercise. It's real simple. If you watch me on my YouTube channels, we do it all within a matter of a few minutes. And then we start our session. But I, I think it's important to have that intention. And people will say, oh, we'll call in protection. I go, that's totally cool. Yeah, call that in. I say, the, what I try to do is instead of thinking, oh, I got to protect myself from something evil, I need to raise my frequency mm. and and my partner's frequency to a level to meet the frequency of that at which I want to connect with. It's like d d dialing in numbers on a phone to connect with somebody. Karen called me today. She pushed the numbers to get my phone. That's the same thing. She dialed my frequency. And so I dial my frequency. And by saying positive things such as, this is what I'm reaching. I am surrounded in love. I'm we're reaching out to those who are our best interested heart. I, I go through a whole series of things and it's it's I pretty much say the same thing every time. I change it up because I don't like I, I don't like monotony or rote. I like to change it up <clears throat> for the moment. And I will actually even put people's names into that prayer that are in the session and, and as well as maybe have a say what I want the session to be dedicated towards or what we're trying to do in that session. And so we will all we'll, do that. And that's how I get it started. And, and that to me is the way we enter the sacred space. You know, our, our cell phones are off. We're not good. There's no distractions. Everybody's in the same space around that table. We've all entered the space through that prayer, the breathing exercise. And now we're here. And, and then that is worth the book. That is worth every penny you pay for the book right there. Yeah, because you're going to do, you can use the same technique in any type of journeys or reading, reading sessions or even hypnosis, any kind of session you do that takes you into another realm. This is, this is implemented. This is the exact same thing I would use. It's what I would use in my therapy sessions. It's what I use when I did hypnosis. It's what I do when I use the cards. It's what I do when I go into meditation or when I do channeling. It's what I do when I go into a board meeting and I need a little extra energy or I want that support. That's what I do. And so it's something that's a takeaway you can use, as you said, Karen, in every walk area of your life. And would you not, is there a space that you wouldn't do it in? Like, I know this is a long leap, but all the stuff that went on on the Skinwalker Ranch, they said it was always tapped off when someone was meditating. If someone was meditating, something definitely happened. Like if you were at the Skinwalker Ranch, would you pull it out or would you be a little like, Meh, I don't know. Absolutely. I pull it out anywhere because this is my way. This is my original way. It's not my only way, but my original way of, of tapping the unseen dimensions. And I, as I said, my spirit guides are there every single time. That's what comes to the board. Then they bring their guests in, if you will. We do guest mystery, mystery guest messages all the time on my YouTube channel. We bring in different energies. They, they bring them in after they come through first. I would love the opportunity to be at Skinwalker Ranch. If anybody can get me in there, I would bring my board and it would, my partner would come and we would have a, a fantastic session. I've no doubt. Oh, and um, I, would, I would tape the podcast because you know what? It was kind of a weird question because I actually would not hesitate to do my tarot there. See, see, because that's your tool. That's I your tool to access the unseen dimension. See, <laughs> when you feel that strongly about your tool, there's no fear. Yes. And also, okay. So when you do it yourself, how does that, what does that physically look like? Does the planchette move and then you perhaps pull it back so it can go to the second letter? Because I'm thinking if there's not both sides, does it just take care of itself? 
it's a lot slower for me and I haven't practiced on it as much. So I was 39 years into using the board when I finally decided to use it by myself. I've always had, I've been fortunate to have incredible partners throughout the years. And I just wanted to do that myself. When I came out into the public, started talking about this uh, work, it was important that I would also, you know, be, sure that I can use it by myself. And I do. It, it's a lot slower. It's shorter sentences. It's not as if you see me on my YouTube channel, I do we do pages before it stops. We'll do paragraphs and pages. Um, this it might be, a, a you know, like a five word sentence and then it stops. And I then I ask the next question or or let it continue. And it's a little more broken. It's not as solid. And I think it's because I just haven't had the practice on it. Uh, and nor do I really need to because I, I have some great partners. And and Karen, I'm actually taking a lot of my work off the board these days and doing it more directly with voice channeling. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I feel like, it too, it's almost like when you – I knew, first of all, I'm looking at my time, and I knew I was going to have 100 questions when this was over. Even – Right. Uh, you're such a great, a great guest. Um, I think when you were talking about the higher vibration and going in with that, I almost think that's where we're moving in the world right now because not only do I feel like the veil is getting thinner, but I feel mm-hmm. like with all this technology, people – I'm getting EVPs on my podcast all the time. I know people are getting them on the phone. I think we've just we're just sort of closer to that that just that general message of bringing your high vibration to your day is going to be where we're going if you don't you know what I mean it's Absolutely um, very, very well said. Real quick, uh, there's, I know that you have, I think, I'm not positive, uh, the Zozo phenomena where people were using the board and the, and it was going Zozo, uh, which then mm-hmm. everyone said Zozo's a demon, but it actually was, was it how the board would move anyways? Or do you have any in, in, uh, information on Zozo? I sure do. Um, yeah, uh, I know Rosemary Allen Guiley and, and Darren Evans, who wrote the book on Zozo phenomenon. Um, Basically, when you first start out using this tool, it's going to go back and forth. It does what it does. It might do figure eights. It might go around the board. It's really just the energy is coming through and learning to feel where the edges of the boards are and also where the alphabet is. And, it, and the alphabet on typical boards are in a uh, rainbow kind of pattern. Um, Darren Evan calls it the rainbow effect. And the rainbow effect happens regardless. It happens with you two people or one person. And just so happens that the way the board is laid out, you've got more consonants on one side and vowels on the other side. You've got A's and O's on the left side. And you've got M's, Z's, L's over on the right side. And you also have a Y. But so it might go mo, mo, ma, ma, uh, zo, zo, az, az. It, so yo, yo, ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. And so people go, oh, phew. It's a demon. <laughs> no, 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 why is that? Why is that? It doesn't have to be that. You guys, if I got that, I did get that pattern before. I've gotten that pattern before. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a demon. Um, you know, there are lower energies that come through that want to trick you sometimes. Uh, and you get to a point where you move beyond that. I'm way beyond that. That that happened probably in my first 10 years of use. It hasn't happened in the last, you know, 30 plus, here we go, 37 years it hasn't happened for me. So you got to look at it this way. You, you, you got to know your tool, know yourself, and understand that, it, the board is set up to create such kind of weird things like that. And not, not that it's anything real. It's just energy's coming through. And if you can get beyond that, it, it, I call it get beyond the dead zone or the trickster zone, then you can start moving into more reliable information. However, I will say this, and I know we're ending, ending the show. I don't want people to go out there and just automatically trust what comes through until you refine and perfect yourself as the instrument. Remember, it's not the tool, it's, it's yourself. And that means many years of your own internal uh, work, looking at yourself, being able to journal, being able to see who you really are, being honest with yourself, raising your frequency, doing your own meditation, your own homework. And before you do that, don't trust anything you get on the board because it could just be just the beginning of energies coming in. Right. And I think, I bet you sort of have, it's almost like you've already created a track. So when you sit down to do your board, you're already on that track. Like you're. Oh, right I in. sit down yeah. and they're here, right? They're like right now, if I put my hands on a planchet right now, they're right here. They're ready to roll. I wow. can feel my tap in that quickly. Yeah. I, maybe we had some EVPs. Maybe they've been chatting with us too. Ooh, I love it. I hope so. <laughs> and uh, and I'll just throw this in. And I always kind of throw this in when somebody, um, because people get very, it's not Christian. It's not, um, they have a religious thing to it. And this is an interesting story that I, I probably told a hundred times. Probably apologize to my fans if you've heard it already. But when I was a little kid, I made up the word busagasa bus. I used to say that over. I was a little kid. Everyone laughed at me and made fun of me. But one day I Googled 
called Is There a Patron Saint of Psychics and Mediums? And there is, and his name is Abagus. Oh, my goodness. Right? And I always want, I, I, I can't really find, I find people quoting him. Uh, uh, he was not a disciple. He worked with one of the disciples, and they did go to him for his psychic insight. Uh, but I'd love to find somebody that could just do a whole episode, because I also thought, well, that's interesting. Someone made him a saint. But that the church is saying these things, it's very, it's one of those complicated both sides of the, of the board, shall we say. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Karen, yeah. Fascinating. All right. So everybody can find you at, I have your website right here, uh, creativevisionspublications.com. That's right. How will they find you on YouTube? Look up Karen A, put the A in there, Karen A Dalvin, D-A-H-L-M-A-N. Um, and you'll find me there. And I, we have like 210 videos or more. And it's all about navigating the unseen dimensions. So come out and join me and join my newsletter too. That'll, you can also link up to my web, my website and go to join my newsletter. Wonderful. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Such a great, uh, interesting, uh, I'm so glad I finally got to, to, uh, uh, meet you. Calvin is so he says such great things about you and hopefully I'll see you somewhere at the big Ouija board, uh, when you take out the giant one. That would be fantastic, Karen. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you guys, everyone, for listening. It's been a joy. Yeah, and also we'll have all uh, her uh, stuff in the in the show notes so you can just click on it. And everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks to Mike at Uno Rising Media. Um, I'll see you all next week. I don't even know if I have anything else to put in. Thanks, Karen. Bye. <laughs>